Welcome to my YouTube channel, Rick Soros Watercolor. It's March 27, 2020, and I'm sitting at home in isolation, as many of my friends and followers are around the world, as we wait for this terrible virus to pass. For this week's video, I tried to come up with something that's a little bit different than what I normally post, but something that might be of interest to those who are sitting around home trying to find ways to keep busy. This is less of a painting, but more of an exercise where I try to demonstrate and discuss as many techniques and concepts as I possibly could in this one exercise. This is a summary of the 40 or so techniques and concepts that I'll attempt to touch on while I do this exercise. I'll be touching on the design elements, value, color, direction, line, texture, shape, and size. And when I'm talking about values, I'll be exploring the full range of values, dark values, middle values, light values, and preserving the pure white of the paper. As far as color, I'll be talking about warm and cool colors. I'll be talking about intense colors versus neutral colors. And I'll also be talking about direction. I'll discuss the use of line, and in this case, straight versus curved. I'll talk about texture and use different techniques for creating texture. I'll review shapes and I'll also talk about size, in particular the scale of shapes to help create depth. Besides the design elements, I'll be demonstrating a variety of washes. Flat wash, a gradated wash with wet on dry, a gradated wash working wet and wet, variegated wash, a charged wash. I'll discuss edges, hard edges, soft edges, lost and found edges, broken edges, negative painting, and then I'll talk about some other techniques, working wet on wet, wet on dry, layering, frisket, working with liquid mask, lifting, also be talking about some other techniques, scraping, working with a spray bottle, painting with gravity, and then I'll talk a little bit about granulation, value dominance, and aerial perspective. This is a different take on how I approach watercolor. I hope you enjoy it and find it informational. This is the sketch that I created for the purpose of this exercise. There's no reference material used for this. It's just uh, trying to come up with something that I could experiment with and demonstrate uh, some different techniques and talk about some different concepts. So this, this is an attempt to be a finished painting by any means. And it's just kind of playing around with some letters and sticking it in a landscape uh, just to use uh, for the purpose of this exercise. To, to do these different techniques and talk about the concepts. I drew this on a quarter sheet of watercolor paper. So it's 11 by 15 inches and it's 140 pound cold press watercolor paper. As I move through this exercise, I'll be touching on all the techniques and concepts that I mentioned on those two summary pages. The first item that I'm gonna talk about or items is working with a frisket to preserve the white of the paper. So those are two things that are on my list, working with a frisket and preserving the white of the paper. So my frisket in this case is going to be clear packing tape. There's a special frisket paper you can buy to do this and um, it's much more expensive and it's hard to get very large sheets of it but I use packing tape and I've used it in some of my other videos so I'm covering the area uh, where the letters are and the, some of the mountain shapes that I have here in my landscape. So I've put my tape down and then I'm going to take a, a small razor knife and what I'm going to do is cut around these letters and some of these mountain shapes that are areas where I want to preserve the white of the paper. I'm not going to show the whole process here because it takes a little bit of time it takes a little bit of patience to do this and it takes some practice and you don't cut so deep into the paper that you actually uh, cut through the paper it's just light pressure enough to basically put a good score into the tape so that when you lift it it tears away and what you do is you leave the tape over the area where you want to preserve the white of the paper so that's one of the, the big things when working with transparent watercolor is preserving the white of paper. 
uh, so that you can explore the full value range from very darks to the pure white of the paper. So I've cut around the letters and now I'm going to cut around some of the, the mountain shapes that I have here in my uh, little exercise. And this is a very inexpensive uh, knife, one of the kinds that has the snap blade on it. I, I find that it works pretty well for me. There's all kinds of fancy knives you can get for this purpose, swivel knives and uh, knives designed for cutting out templates and friskets. But I find that this very inexpensive little breakaway knife uh, does the job uh, for me. I'll mention that normally when you're using a frisket, it's because you want to protect a large area uh, in your composition and preserve the white of the paper. You, you normally wouldn't use masking fluid to cover this big an area. And some of the, the, the times where I find this works for me is when I have a painting where I want to have a big wash that goes across the large area of the page, but I want to preserve uh, some of the, the whites and the lights uh, in some very specific areas. So rather than trying to do this fluid wash where I have to cut around all these shapes with my brush, I put the, uh, a frisket on and I, I'm free to put this large wash on and it, and it preserves the white in these very specific areas. When I'm ready to remove the, the frisket from the areas that I don't want to protect, I just take the tip of that knife and I just lift up underneath and pull it up. This takes a little bit of patience too and you have to make sure you're lifting up the area that you want to paint over and not the area you want to protect because it's easier to get it uh, mixed up. Here I'm taking off the last of my frisket. And as I said, th this takes a little bit of practice, a little bit of patience. It can be quite tedious. So it's not for everybody, but I find it to be a very effective technique and, and it can be very productive in uh, getting down a large wash over a large area, but protecting specific areas. Another way to preserve the white of the paper is working with liquid uh, masking fluid. In this case I'm applying it with a fine tip uh, that dispenses a fine line. So it's a good technique for creating texture, grassy shapes, linear shapes. You can use them to help create some sense of direction as you uh, try to lead the viewer's eye somewhere. The direction of branches or grassy shapes that you can use to lead uh, the viewer in. So here's, these are a couple other things on my list in the summary. When I was talking about direction, one of the design elements, and talking about using a liquid mask, and in this case working with a fine line masking bottle or pen. And this is a bottle that I fill myself. You can buy them filled commercially. Uh, they both work uh, very well. And here I'm just creating some grassy shapes to my landscape and uh, you don't put a lot of pressure on it. If you squeeze too hard you get big blobs of masking fluid. If you just put light pressure and, and write almost like you would with a rolling pen you'll get a better uh, result. So here I'm just putting in some of these linear marks uh, to, to preserve some very light grassy shapes. I'll go back to my list of things to cover again and, and just to reinforce what we're doing here we're using liquid mask with a fine line application. We're cre creating line. We're, we're using direction and, and where I'm positioning the direction of these grassy shapes. And I'm preserving the white of the paper. I'm also using curved lines here that will be in contrast to some of the straight lines in my composition. If you look at my sketch, the straight lines of the letter, the straight lines of the tree trunks. So there's a contrasting uh, use of line here curved and straight. Now I'm going to show a, another method for applying liquid masking fluid and this is going to be splattering. So I have a toothbrush here that I've rinsed first in soapy water so that it cleans up easier and I've dipped it in a jar of masking fluid. You can also squeeze it out of a, a bottle into it but I'm using that uh, toothbrush to help create splatter. So I pull the bristles back that creates splatter and if I hit it against my wrist that create splatter. It'll actually create a bigger 
uh, drop than just pulling the bristles. I'll keep going back to my list throughout this video. So I'll go back now and here on my list I'm using liquid masking fluid again but this time my application is a splatter technique and rather than trying to create fine lines or block off a large area this time I'm using that to create texture. So using that splatter uh, from the toothbrush is going to uh, result in a texture uh, when I lift that off later on in the painting process. At this point all the masking fluid is dry so I have three different types of masking on here. I have the frisket that I put on with the tape and I have the uh, masking fluid put on with a fine line pen and I have uh, splatter masking fluid on there, liquid masking fluid. So those are three different ways where I'm preserving the white of the paper. One is to block off a large area. One is to uh, preserve the white in the form of uh, fine lines. And the other one is to preserve the white of the paper to give me textural qualities. So those are dry and now you can see that I've been applying water to wet the page. So I'm going to start to apply a variety of washes and I'll begin working wet on wet. I'm going to begin working with a very warm, very bright, intense yellow. So this is Hansa yellow and I'm working on wet paper, remember. and. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is you can get your most intense color working on the pure white of the paper. Once you put a color down and you start to put a color over that, you're, you lose your opportunity to optimize the intensity of the, the color that you're putting down. And you can see uh, that this is going to be a variegated wash. So I'm using different colors and working wet on wet I'm applying these colors beside each other but I'm not necessarily putting them uh, one into the other and letting them run around I'm positioning it so that the, the edges of the two colors will, will mingle uh, but they're really not going to mix too much but they'll, they'll be a nice transition and that'll be more important when I move over towards the left here where I'm going to start to apply blue and sometimes people will ask me, how did you get that sky wash in without mixing the, the blue and orange and getting gray or the, the uh, blue and yellow and getting green? And one of the ways is to apply it in a matter of a variegated wash. So uh, you're, you're positioning this side by side and gravity is pulling the pigment down the page. That's one of the other things that I talked about was painting on my list would be to painting with gravity. So here I'm using gravity to my advantage. I, I, that blue and those that orange, while they're side by side and the edges of them are mingling, I'm not getting uh, a gray color, which you can get when you mix complements, an orange and a blue. So I'm going to pick up this excess uh, puddling. Because I have this frisket here, it, it's going to block the flow of that paint and cause some puddles and if I don't pick those up I'm going to start to get some backwash. And that's something I didn't put on my list but um, that's something that's important to talk about too is managing the moisture content to avoid backwash. I'm going to freeze this for a moment and review what we just did. I wet the paper and remember I have the variety of masking techniques applied already. So I wet the paper and then I came in with a very bright yellow. It's very intense and that's as intense as I can get that yellow by painting it on the pure white of the paper. Once I start to put it over top of another pigment I'll lose the intensity. And uh, I started to introduce another mixture which is actually lemon or the Hansa yellow with a little bit of quinacridone and coral mixed in to give me a, an orange tone. And I placed that beside the yellow tone, not in the yellow tone but beside it and those edges started to mingle because the paper is wet. As I move farther to the left, I introduce cerulean blue, a cool color. So now I have warm and cool colors and I have bright colors and I haven't really started to introduce neutrals yet. 
but I have this blue position right beside the orange tone and they're not creating a neutral which could happen because I'm applying it in a method of a variegated wash. So they're side by side, the paper's wet, the edges will mingle and fuse together, but they're not really going to mix and gravity is going to take those colors down the page. Now if I wanted to have that yellow, bright yellow all the way across the horizon line from left to right, I would rotate my board 90 degrees and keep that yellow right along the edges of the mountain and on the far right of the, the edge, which would be the top of the page, I start to introduce that blue and gravity would pull those uh, in the right direction to achieve that. And then once it was dried, I'd rotate it back over and I'd have that nice bright tone all the way across the horizon and the bluer tone high, higher up, but they wouldn't mix together to give me a green. So this is a variegated wash applied working wet on wet. Now I've dried the, the wash that I put down and I'm going to be working wet on dry here. So my paper's dry and I have a, a very fluid mixture that I'm putting down, but it's still a pretty intense mixture. Um, and it's a darker value than the, the Hansa yellow that I have down. Now this is a mixture still of Hansa yellow and quinacrin and coral, but it's very um, rich in pigment and uh, makes a, a very intense tone here. One of the concepts we can start to talk about here is negative space. I've painted that bright orange sun shape uh, to suggest that it's coming up over the, the mountain there on the horizon and I have the, the letter T going over there and that sun starts to create a positive negative relationship with the T shape. So if you look at that by stopping that right at the edge of the T, it starts to define the edge of the T without actually painting it. And it's actually doing the same with the uh, mountain top. So starting to establish positive and negative relationships. The other thing I'll point out is that uh, I've started to establish some hard edges here. That sun is a very hard, rigid shape where if you look at some of the variegated washes I put down, there's some, some shapes of color, but they're very soft edge and it's a, it's a soft transition from one to the next. So now we're starting to talk about hard edge, soft edges. Now I'm gonna rotate my board and we're gonna talk about another kind of wash and that's gonna be a gradated wash. So I'm working wet on dry in this instance and I put down some of this orange tone and now I'm going to take um, some clear water and I'm going to soften that as it moves away from that hard edge so I have a hard edge and a soft edge but I'm also changing the value from a darker value to a lighter value so it's kind of a middle value that orange is on the edge and then when I bring in that clear water I start to put in a gradated wash working wet on dry and I start to gradate the value of the wash. I'm not gradating the color, but the value, the light to dark qualities. You'll notice how I often use a tissue to blot. That's another way that I like to help soften edges. Now I've dried my paper and I rotated it back uh, to the upright position and now I'm just going to give the suggestion of uh, the reflection of the, those mountain shapes so um, I'm taking some of this orange tone and I'm going to do exactly what I did on the other side you know creating an edge a harder edge and then I'm taking clear water and I'm softening it going the other way and this is still a gradated wash, so it's going from a, a darker, or not really a dark value, but a middle value, to a very light value. And it just starts to disappear without an edge on that, that's that gradated side of it. In my landscape here, I have some ripples, so here again is a positive-negative relationship because I'm, I'm giving the suggestion of some ripples in the water, but I'm stopping it on the edge of these letters. Uh, so that uh, 
they they help uh, further define the edges of those letters and again this isn't a, a painting of something this is more of a an illustration if anything but it's a it's just an exercise here to demonstrate these very uh, various concepts Here I'm going to pause for a moment once again and I'm going to review where we uh, have gone to this point. I've used the masking fluid, I've used the frisket, I've applied a variegated wash, I've used bright colors, I've used warm colors, I've used cool colors, I have color intensity, I've started to use a gradated wash, I have hard edges, I have soft edges, talk a little bit about texture and creating fine lines to preserve the white of the paper. So those are all some of the things that have been on that are on that list that um, I've touched on as I've, I've come this very short distance in this uh, exercise. Now once again I'm going to be working with a gradated wash, this time with a, a cool color. I'm working with cerulean blue and above the mountain I'm going to be doing it wet on dry below the mountain I'll be doing it wet on wet and one of the things I'll point out is I'm using cerulean blue and it's a heavier body paint than some and this mixture has more pigmentation than the first wash I put down and you'll start to get some granulation so it's maybe hard to see on the video but when you're working with a heavy body paint such as the cerulean and it the, the pigments kind of suspended and you have a little texture in your paper you'll start to get some granulation uh, in the wash that you're putting down cobalt violet gives a nice granulation um, but uh, that's another thing on my list so that just provides some interest to your wash creates a little texture a little pattern sometimes and it can be an interesting effect so now that I've done it wet on uh, dry I'm going to put down a, a gradated wash working wet on wet. So I'm taking clear water, I'm wetting the paper, and then I'm going to come in with a cerulean blue and uh, I'll apply once again a gradated wash. So my board is at about a 20 degree angle so gravity is helping me once again and it'll help gradate that wash so I have that the saturated paper so when I put that first brush stroke down it immediately starts to flow down the page and you'll see some granulation in that also and that granulation is, is also enhanced with gravity as it, as it makes the, the pigment start to flow down the page so here you can see two gradated washes um, the, the ones below the mountain base there that are reflected in the kind of the water and then the one up above the mountain top in the sky. So I've dried my uh, washes that I just put down and now I'm going to lift off some of the frisket. So I'm removing the frisket from the mountain shapes but I'm going to leave it uh, on the letters because I want to be able to paint these mountain shapes around um, the letters so I still I'm going to protect the pure white of the paper there everything is dry now and I'm going to start to paint uh, some of the mountain shape here so I'm going to give a suggestion that part of it's in shadow here so I'm using a mixture of cobalt blue and uh, cobalt blue with a little bit of uh, rose matter quinacridone in it to give me a little bit of a violet tone and I'm going to just uh, soften that as I uh, move away from the harder edge that I've put down. And one of the things I'll talk about here is aerial perspective. Aerial perspective touches on the fact that things that are in the distance have atmosphere between you, the viewer, and that object such as a mountain which is in the distance. And that atmosphere impacts the way you see things in the distance. So they're not as clear, they're not as crisp and they tend to take on a bluish cast. So I'm going to uh, just give a little suggestion of that here as I paint this. It's, it's probably not the best example, but as I put in uh, some of these, the, the mountain and the hillside here, I'll have sort of a bluish cast to it and, and uh, I'll have a softer uh, 
less definitive edge to the, the, the kind of the, the hills that are going across the base of this mountain. So again, aerial perspective. One of the things on the list I talked about, so things in the distance are affected by the atmosphere. A lot of times there's a blue cast to them, but things are, are, are not as well defined in the distance. So a little harder to see because they're being impacted by the atmosphere. So when you start thinking about that and you say, how do I convey that in my painting? You start to think about the method of application and things in the distance um, working wet on wet is often a, a, a good solution or a, a, a nice application, a uh, nice technique to use when you're trying to convey distance and, and uh, drive that, that uh, impression home because those mountains or tree lines or whatever it is in the distance aren't going to be as clear or as crisp as those that are, are near, uh, near you. So they're going to have softer edges in this so working wet on wet as I am right here is a good way to try and suggest that. To me it's all about suggestion and trying to uh, interpret and give the uh, the atmosphere that you want. So you can see that that doesn't have a hard edge there in the distance but if that were closer to me I'd probably paint it with a very crisp hard edge and it'd probably be darker value um, as it got close to me too. Um, not always, but sometimes you can have a dark value dominance in the background. Uh, but in this instance, it's going to be a lighter value in the, in the background. And here I'm starting to establish a foreground, middle ground, and a background as this evolves. Now I want to reflect some of that blue, blue green down into the water. So I'm going to put down a wash here of uh, some of this blue green. And I've left a little bit of a break between it and the landmass itself, which is, is kind of what occurs naturally when you look at that. There's a separation and a lot of times a, a light highlight between the, the two. And I want to soften that. So this time I'm going to soften the edge using this spray bottle. So this is another technique on my list, the spray bottle. And this is a, a, a method I like to use frequently to help soften edges and diffuse color. Now I'm going to carry the blue, blue, green uh, middle value wash across uh, the rest of my uh, hillsides and tree lines that I've kind of suggested there. And remember, I still have the uh, frisket on the letters there, so those are going to maintain nice clean edges. I've continued to carry that across and now I'm going to bring it all the way to the edge. And I have a, a little bit of a, a stronger edge here uh, on, on the, the hillside shape here than I do on the other side on the left where it's a softer, fuzzier edge. I want to suggest a, a tree line going across um, in front of the, the hills so I'm coming in with a a bit darker valued uh, blue-green mixture and I take some water and I just let that uh, gradate down to the bottom there You can see I've made uh, the, the edge of that irregular to suggest that, it, that it's a tree line rather than a hill. And I want to carry that on the other side here. But it won't go be as strong and go as far. It won't go all the way across there. I'm going to leave some of that softness on the, the left hand side there. I'm going to soften it up a bit with a spray bottle. I want that uh, blue-green tone to reflect down into the water more. So I'm going to put uh, some of the blue-green mixture. You can see it's wet. 
and then I put my brush there it starts to diffuse and that's from the spraying that I did I'm going to carry that across and I still want that yellow to show through but I'm going to diffuse uh, this blue green over top of it a little bit by using the spray bottle so that yellow has been dry for since I put it on early on and so I can come and build this this wash over top of it and this is one of the things too and on my list was talking about layering I've just begun to really start to to layer uh, some of these washes and start to build some layers here and that'll be more evident as I move closer to the to the foreground start to put in some of these trees there'll be a lot of uh, layering and overlapping you can see how with that spray bottle I can just diffuse that color down and give the the suggestion of reflecting now I'm going to paint some of these tree shapes that here here in the middle ground and uh, I'm going to put this in with a flat wash. So this isn't going to be a gradated wash like I've been using in most of the painting to this point. This is going to be a flat wash. I have a, a kind of a dark middle value blue-green mixture here. And I have a, a fairly good pool of it on my palette. And I'm just going to take that, uh, that same color, that same mixture from my palette. And I'm just going to apply it in a flat wash. Now, even though I, the, I'm using the term flat, my board is still at an angle. I almost always paint at a slight angle, uh, at incline to work with gravity. The, the, the term, the, and in terms of the regards that I'm using the term flat, I'm referring to this flat tone that I'm putting down, not that my surface is flat. So a gradated wash has a shifting of value or color where a flat wash is just uh, a consistent wash of, of one value or one color. So now you can see this layer here uh, over top of all the, the painting I've done to this point. So and that's one of the nice things with uh, transparent watercolor, um, how you can build up the layers and you get some of those nice soft effects early on then you can come on in with some stronger hard edge painting um, but it requires some planning to think about the sequence that you need to uh, take uh, in your painting process now I'm going to use some of the same techniques that I used earlier here just to give the suggestion of some reflections coming into the water. So I'm taking the same mixture that I painted the, the trees and the landmass there and I'm just giving the suggestion of the reflection in the water and I use my uh, spray bottle to do this. This is one of the ways I like to suggest the reflection into the water and uh, there's other techniques I use too, some of the brushwork I do that don't involve using a, the spray bottle, but I kind of like this effect, um, so I decided to use that here. And I, I need to do this before I paint the trees in the foreground, because those trees in the foreground are going to be overlapping what's going on behind them. So you, you, you can't get the same effect if, if I were to paint the trees in the foreground and try and put this in between them, it wouldn't get the same effect. But because I'm putting darker values over top of uh, this wash, I can approach it this way and build a layer on top of it. I'm going to put some uh, touches of a dark value on these tree shapes and the landmass that I painted just to give them a, a little bit more of a, a three-dimensional feeling so they're not as flat. Um, however, the dominant value in this this middle ground area is going to be a, a middle value even though it's a dark middle value it's going to be middle value so this is uh, still a wet mixture that I put down and I'm going to take a plastic scraping tool put a little bit more paint down there I'll take this plastic scraping tool and I'm going to just drag some of that wet paint up and just give the suggestion of uh, some grass, some, some linear grassy marks there.
So that's a, a scraping technique you can use in these situations. I'm also going to take that fine mist spray and just drag some of that color down, diffuse it uh, into the water. I mentioned that the middle ground is going to be a middle value dominance and the, the foreground is going to be a dark value dominance. So I'm going to start to come in with a much darker tree shapes here, very dark valued. And they're going to be overlapping all this activity behind it. Uh, but I'm setting up a situation where I'm going to have a dark value dominance in the foreground, a middle value dominance in the middle ground, and a light value dominance in the background. And by doing that, you start to give the feeling of space. When you have equal amounts of a value, say a dark value in the foreground, middle ground, and background, it tends to look flat and be confusing for the viewer because it's hard to discern what's close, what's far away, but when you differentiate the value dominance, it's easier to, ma to make that separation and understand what's in the background, what's in the middle ground, and what's in the foreground. Another thing I'll mention at this point is uh, size, one of the design elements, and in particular I'll talk about scale. So these trees that are in the foreground here are much taller, much larger uh, shapes than those that are in the middle ground there on the left side. And this is where scale starts to play a role in helping the viewer understand what's foreground, what's middle ground, background. Just as value helps the, the viewer see and make that separation. Scale is another technique to achieve that. And you combine that with overlapping. So you have these large, dark valued, overlapping shapes that are trees. And you can tell that they belong in the foreground. So far, I've used some very bright, intense colors with the yellows and oranges. And I've used some. Uh, some dark valued blue greens. They're cool, but they still have uh, a pure uh, color to them. They're, they're, um, even though they're dark valued, they've got quite a bit of, of color to them. And I haven't really done much with neutrals. So now I'm going to start to pick up some of that orange uh, light into this wash that I'm putting down. So I'm going to do that by taking some of that orange and mixing it with some blue. And that's going to start to neutralize that orange and move it more towards the neutral pole. And um, I'm I'm putting it. I'll be putting it into the same wash. So I'm putting this big wash down of this dark blue blue green uh, mixture. And now I'm taking some of the uh, orange, which has been uh, taken a little bit more towards neutral, with the addition of blue, and it, and it starts to warm up this wash in some of these areas, they give the suggestion of, of the, the warm light hitting it. Um, and I like to, I, I kind of call this charging my wash. This is where I, when I put down a wash, let's say even if it's on the side of a building, uh, it, it may be a, a fairly even value or a, a flat wash, but it might have a variety of colors in it. So you can see here, you have this blue, blue, green, very dark value, but you have some of these muted oranges that I've started to bring into that. And here I'm doing more scraping with my scraper. While that paint is still damp and movable, I'm just uh, scraping some light tones into them and dragging the, the, the paint mixture, uh, the darker value, over top of some of the lighter washes that I put down earlier. This is also another example of a curved line. So these, these grassy marks I'm making are linear marks and I can, I can arc them in a manner that they lead you to, to look more towards the, the letters, the spelling where I've spelled out art. Um, so that has to do with line, has to do with uh, a curved line and uh, direction. So the direction that I'm, I'm put placing those lines and arcing those lines uh, is important. So I'm putting these uh, dark valued uh, tree shapes here that are on the left side in the foreground in, and I'm 
putting some touches of the muted orange on the edges of this tree. It's a little hard to see. I'll be putting more in. And one of the things I'll mention at this point, if I go back to my list that summarizes all the techniques and concepts that I was going to cover, at this point, so far, I've talked about 35 of those uh, throughout the demonstration. I have a handful more to, to cover, and I'll be repeating some that I've already covered. One of the points I'm trying to make here is that there's a lot of technique and, and uh, different concepts that come into play when you are doing a painting. You can see here on this tree at the bottom, I've uh, put some uh, uh, a yellow-green mixture into the wash there. Um, so I, it's a bit of a muted yellow. So I have uh, the blues, the blue-greens going on, but then I've worked in some of the muted orange, some muted yellow, and uh, just to, to put a little bit of a glow into the, the trees and the highlighting on the... the, the uh, ground. And here I'm just putting the finishing touches on this uh, wash that I put down that covers these, these large tree shapes. Next I'll begin to paint uh, a wash of royal blue uh, here in the water in the foreground. I want this to be a darker value than what it is right now. So I'm working with royal blue and my brush strokes are horizontal and that horizontal helps to contour the water and give the feeling that it's a fairly flat um, body of water. Not a lot of waves or anything going on but there are some ripples and some breaks in the water that reflect the light. They have these rock shapes in the water. So I'm going to put a, a touch of orange on the, the leading edge of those. And I'm going to come in with a dark valued royal blue mixture. And paint the shadow side of those rocks. And these are fairly close. So uh, just as I have with the other uh, objects that are more towards the foreground, I've got a very dark value to help make them feel like they're part of this foreground and not as distant, although they're not right here on the, the bank of this body of water. I'm going to do some similar brushwork here on the right hand side. I have some rock shapes. And as I had mentioned, this, this is less a painting, more of an exercise, and there's no reference material here. I'm just making this up as I go. Um, and it's, it's a little different than what I normally do, as I said at the very beginning, but I wanted to try and create something that has some interest and uh, was a little different for this uh, tough times that everybody's been going through. So far I've talked about soft edges and hard edges. And now I'm going to demonstrate broken edges. Broken edges have more of a textural quality. And I'm going to use a half inch flat brush to do this. And it's a damp brush. It's not fully loaded with paint. But I'm loading it up with a dark value. And I've taken some of the moisture away. And I'm going to drag the side of the brush. And as I drag it, I don't get a solid hard edge. I get this broken uh, edge as it's referred to. This is a good technique to use on the trunk of a tree, or it does a nice job suggesting the ripples in the water. Here I've started to remove the frisket that I applied at the very beginning uh, on the letters here. I'm removing that frisket. Now that I have the frisket removed, I'm going to remove the, the liquid mask that I applied early also. And to do that, I'm using a, what's called a rubber cement pickup eraser. So you just rub it over the top, and it picks up all the uh, 
dried liquid mask that was applied earlier. One of those was applied with a, a, a fine line uh, tip and the other one was was the splatter from the toothbrush. And now you can see the areas where I preserve the white of the paper. Next I'm going to move on to something that I haven't discussed yet and that's lifting. So I have a uh, nylon brush here. It's an angled uh, brush, kind of a f angled flat brush. It's nylon. It has a nice edge to it. So I, I put it in water and take some of the water off so it's just a damp brush. And you can see as I go over the top of the, the wash that I've applied and come in with a tissue, it lifts some of the pigment. So this starts to reveal a lighter tone. This is just another technique to uh, cut back to the white of the paper, but you'll never get as pure a white as you do by the masking technique or painting around. You'll, it's hard to get back to the pure white of the paper. I'll add some more linear shapes to the foreground here by using this lifting technique. And one of the things I like to do is when I do this is while it cuts away and lifts the pigment from the darker valued area, it also moves some of that dark valued pigment over top of the lighter value area. So you can see as I drag that brush over the area I'm lifting off, I continue on and I pull some of that paint over top, some of the lighter valued areas. Now here's another lifting technique. So I have a spray bottle. This is a different spray bottle than the, the one I use with a fine mist to soften edges. This has a coarse spray. So I spritz some water on this and then I, I strike it with a tissue. And hopefully you can see there's some textural quality starting to appear. So this is just another lifting technique. And you can also do this by uh, loading your brush with water and tapping it on your wrist like this. It splatters water droplets and then you just hit it with a tissue and you just kind of rub it and strike the paper and it lifts off some of the pigment and, and creates some textural qualities. So that's another lifting technique. Now I'm going to show you a third method of uh, lifting. So once again I'm going to create a mask and this time I'm using rice tape so this is a tape that's designed originally for draftsmen and uh, it, it seals uh, nicely on the edge that you're trying to mask and the nice thing about it is it comes up fairly easily and it doesn't damage the paper when you lift it off but it does have a nice seal so um, that works very well when you want to mask off and have a nice clean edge and paint to paint up to it but in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do some lifting. So I want to carry some of these edges of these letters down and make them become more a part of my composition rather than something just, just feels like pasted on. So I'm using a magic eraser, one of those scrubbing sponges you use and clean up, and Mr. Clean uh, puts out. And just rinse it a little better and it'll lift out here. So I'm gently rubbing that paper and lifting some of that pigment. And again, you'll never get it back to the pure white, but you can do a pretty good job with this magic eraser. And uh, I'm going to have a nice edge there because of the rice tape that I've put along the edge here. So uh, when I uh, lift that rice tape, you're going to see the nice clean edge that I get. So I've dried it and I'm going to lift off this tape and you see that I have a nice edge and it doesn't, the tape hasn't damaged the paper uh, at all and it comes up very easily. But now I've just kind of carried the, that light value of that, that shape of the letter uh, down in the composition and, and create more of a, a feeling of a gradation. Starting to suggest that there might be some rocks on the other side of this, this uh, these grassy shapes that are coming up. So I'm putting a dark blue value there. 
and making it look as though the, these areas of grass that are reaching out over the water are overlapping uh, these dark valued rocks. I want to come back and I'm going to glaze over these areas where I masked early on with liquid masking, the, both the fine lines and the splatter. So I'm going to put a, an orange wash over top of those to bring the feeling of that, that light coming in and hitting some of the areas uh, uh, on top of this, this very dark valued area. So just giving some nice warm accents within these dark shapes, these very cool dark shapes. I want to bring some of these bright orange accents uh, into the water here, some of the, the more intense orange uh, color. So I want to carry some of that, the, the feeling of the ripples that I've done with the dark blue. I want to carry some of that same activity up into the orange area. So this helps flatten it out a little bit using the direction again, horizontal brush strokes here to help contour the flatness of the water so it doesn't feel like that area is just kind of floating. I could leave these letters white but in order to demonstrate uh, another masking technique here using the rice tape I'm going to go ahead and put a gradated wash on the tops of these letters. And I'm actually going to work in some cool blue mixtures to contrast the, the bright you know, warm sky behind it. So in this application I'll be using the rice tape to create a frisket just as I did with the clear tape. And the reason I don't use the clear tape for this is when you've already uh, put some paint on the paper the clear tape tends to lift that off and pick up some of the nap of the paper. The rice tape won't do that and the application method here is a little bit more precise than putting on the large strips of tape. So I put that tape around the areas that I want to protect and I cut off uh, some of the excess there to trim it so it goes right to the, the, the area that I want covered. Now I could have just painted this freehand without any masking but I want a nice clean edge uh, against these light skies and I know that I'd have a little bit of irregularity to my brush stroke so I went ahead and masked and the other reason is I wanted to show this technique. So uh, with the masking I can be a little bit freer with my brush stroke and I can uh, come in and easily gradate that wash. I have put the darker value at the top and I'm starting to bring in some water but I'll maintain a nice clean edge because I have that rice tape. I can also um, as I bring this wash down, if I want to soften the edge and blot it with a tissue, I can do it very easily with a frisket in place and not worry about uh, dragging color with the tissue somewhere that I don't want. So here I'm trying to, to bring that A down into the composition a little bit more. And here I'm going to be able to blot this and soften it up. And that, I couldn't do that if I didn't have that frisket in place. It would be hard to do. And now I'm going to continue with some of that darker value going across the tops. So remember, this is a gradated wash that I'm using. Uh, I'm gradating the value from dark to light. And we also, earlier on, used flat washes. And... Uh, a variegated wash was the very first wash that I applied when I did the sky. And I also use what I like to call a charge wash here in the foreground, especially where I injected a variety of color into that wash. So I have some of those neutral oranges and yellows mixed in with the blues and the blue green. I'm going to bring some of that blue down the the vertical element of that T. And again, I want to soften that. 
Now, as I remove the tape, you'll see that I have some nice clean edges. And I like the uh, gradient effect on the, the tops of these letters. I think it makes them stand out a little bit more and not get uh, so lost. Now I'm going to take a, a liner brush here and I want to carry some of these uh, uh, brush strokes over the letters and some of the areas that were masked early on because I don't want to look so much like they were cut out and pasted on there. I want them to feel more part of what's going on and provide some overlap. So I'm taking some uh, linear marks and I'm just uh, coming in the same area that I had put them before, but I'm I'm putting them over top of some of the, the areas that were masked. And that's something you have to watch for when you're doing a painting. If you've masked an area and you've done some painting around it and it's an area that's set back a little bit, you want to make sure that you uh, do some of this brushwork on top of it and create some overlap where it will feel uh, like it's cut out and pasted on. Um, you want it to feel like it was it, it, it evolved as part of the painting, which it did, but um, you need to give it a, a position in space that makes sense and overlap is a way to help um, make sense of the positioning and the spatial relationships in a composition. So another way to create texture uh, is with splatter. Uh, just as I splattered the masking fluid early on and then lifted it off, um, I can create texture by loading my brush up with paint and tapping it against my, my hand to create splatter. And sometimes you want to cover an area because just as I did there, you'll get it in an area you may, where you may not want it. But loading your brush and tapping it against your hand will um, produce a, a splatter that will create a nice texture. I've decided that I want to add another tree here, not just because I want another tree, but I want to break up this shape um, where the water is in front of the foreground here a little bit more. It just feels like too even of a bowl right in the middle. So I'm going to put another uh, tree shape or two here to, to break that up a little bit so it doesn't look like a, like I said, like a bowl sitting in the middle of these trees. I can pretty much stop here. I've covered just about every technique and concept that I wanted to cover, but I'm going to uh, just show a little bit more how, how you can lift off. And in doing so, I'm going to try and tie these letters into the composition a bit more and make it um, a little bit more geometric and abstract. So I've put some rice tape down and now I've got my um, uh, magic eraser here that's saturated with water and then when I do this you can see there's the paint just kind of smears there so I just clean in my my erase magic eraser out rinse it and bring it back uh, to lift out some more of that and, and I use a tissue a lot to blot so you can see that I was able to lift out a continuation of that the letters and, and I, was, I was able to bring that vertical element down to the bottom of the page I'm going to put some tape uh, right alongside that the uh, uh, the diagonal element of the R and just on the one edge and I'm going to take my um, magic eraser and I'm just going to lift a little bit on that edge to bring it down a little farther and then just lift that off very simple very quick I'm going to tie this letter to the side a little bit and just make this a little bit more involved. So I'm going to put some, some of the rice tape down. It tears very easily by hand, but if you need a clean uh, cut, you can just use scissors or a knife. So there I've uh, put a little narrow horizontal line there 
and I'm going to lift in between the, the tape and that's going to give me a light uh, horizontal element that's going to go to the edge of the page. So again I'll lift that tape and you can see it looks pretty well and against that dark value it looks like it's almost white of the paper but if you were just to look at that and against the pure white you would see the difference. I'm going to repeat that same uh, technique over here on the left side. I'm going to continue with another horizontal line to tie the, the edge of this A uh, to the edge of my composition and I didn't want it to be a straight line across from the other one I did so I lowered it a little bit and um, again this is just an exercise just playing around with some shapes and techniques and different concepts and um, so it's a, it's a chance to uh, experiment and uh, add a little creativity. I'll use this type of a geometric approach with shapes and lines sometimes in some of my kind of abstract florals with negative painting going on. I'll work in some geometric shapes and some squares and some rectangles and lines uh, and I'll use this same technique to, to create those. Now I'm going to add one more uh, linear element here to, to connect this kind of extension of the R to the right side of my composition, to the right edge of my composition. So same technique um, using the rice tape and then the magic eraser. The magic eraser is pretty saturated when I do this. Of rubbing off the pigment and then blotting it with a tissue and there you can see you get a nice clean light valued uh, linear element and that just about wraps this up even though this is an exercise I'm going to put a white mat around to get rid of all the tape in the board and you can get a good look at um, the result of this exercise and there you have it. In the completing of this exercise, I've touched on 40 or so different techniques and concepts. So let's do a quick review of what those were. I'll begin with the design elements. Talk about value, dark value, middle value, light value. I talked about the placement of those in a foreground, middle ground, and background. Talked about preserving the whites of the paper. We talked about color. I used warm colors, I used cool colors. I had intense colors and I used neutral colors later on in the painting process. I talked about direction and how you could uh, use those arcing grassy shapes to lead the viewer to your uh, center of interest. I talked about the vertical trees and the horizontal ripples in the water and how that helped flatten the water out and contour the water so it didn't feel like the, the space was just floating. I also talked about line with some of those linear shapes, arcing lines, straight lines, so the curve versus the straight. And we talked about texture. I created that with different ways. I spritzed water on the paper and lifted it. I used uh, masking to um, create uh, texture by splattering the masking fluid. And then I also created texture by splattering paint talked about shapes, large versus small. I talked about scale and how that can help define where uh, things are in space. And I also talked about overlapping shapes and how that helps uh, define spatial relationships. And as I already mentioned with size of shapes and scale and how that helps uh, define where objects are in space. Now we'll move on to the uh, second page of the summary and we'll talk about washes. I talked about using a flat wash. I demonstrated doing a gradated wash working wet on dry. I demonstrated a gradated wash working wet on wet. I started out the whole painting with a variegated wash and uh, demonstrated how I could put those colors side by side and didn't have them make each other muddy or neutral. Um, by using a, a variegated wash and gravity. I also talked about charging your wash uh, later in the video where I started to inject some warmer tones in some of my cool washes of those trees in the foreground. 
talked about edges, hard edges, soft edges, and uh, didn't talk so much about lost and found edges, but that's where in those letters where some of those letters run together and the edge just gets lost and picked back up on the other end and the viewer's eye will pick that up. I talked about broken edges where I use that to help give the suggestion of ripples in the water and I talked about negative painting, painting on, on the, in the uh, outside edge of, a, of another shape to help define that positive shape. We moved on and we talked about uh, wet on wet and I demonstrated working wet on wet. I worked wet on dry. We talked about layering. I showed a number of examples of using a frisket and with a liquid masking fluid I demonstrated both working with a fine line masking fluid pen or bottle and I also showed a splatter technique using a toothbrush. As far as lifting I did some lifting with a, a, ni a nylon brush that had a nice edge on it and I did some uh, splattering with uh, water on my paintbrush and then uh, lifting with a tissue and I also spritzed with a, a coarse spray from a bottle and then lifted with a tissue. I also gave some demonstrations where I scraped some of the linear shapes into uh, the wash that I put down and I showed several examples where I used a spray bottle, a fine mist spray bottle, to soften my edges and I talked throughout about how I used gravity and uh, Early on I talked a little bit about granulation and how you can get a heavy body paint to get some granulation and gives a nice texture in your wash. I also talked a little bit about value dominance in terms of foreground, middle ground, and background. And I talked early on about aerial perspective uh, as it relates to uh, objects in the distance and how they're uh, not as uh, defined and they tend to take on a bluish cast. And that completes this video on 40 watercolor techniques and concepts. As I mentioned, this is a bit of a different format for me for my videos, but I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope everybody stays safe and healthy.